Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really thrilled to have you join us for our final event for the spring semester at uh, NYU Law with the Venture Fund. Uh, I know folks are going to be joining in here, but we can go ahead and get started and really excited to um, jump into our conversation. But before we do that, just wanted to quickly share a little bit about the Venture Fund, and then we can get started with tonight's event. Uh, so for those of you who are not aware uh, or are not as familiar, I wanted to let you know that the Venture Fund exists at the law school at NYU to bring together our community of students, of alumni, and of community members who are circling the orbit around uh, venture funds, around venture capital, around entrepreneurship and startups. And we offer a number of different programs uh, and events for the community, uh, this being one of them, uh, but also want to highlight a few others that we offer for both students and for our alumni. Uh, and they're on the screen here, so you can see that, so I'm not going to read through that, but just wanted to kind of highlight them for you. Uh, as I mentioned, this is our final event for the spring, but we'll be back again with some programming over the summer, as well as then programming looking into the fall semester. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm really, really thrilled and delighted to welcome two of our alumni uh, tonight uh, to this event. Uh, so really thrilled to have uh, the general counsels from AWAY and from ClassPass, but I'm not going to officially introduce them because uh, we are hosting this event in partnership with uh, Law Women, a student group at NYU Law, and I'm really thrilled to have Io who is a 2L at NYU Law and one of the co-presidents here with us this evening. She is going to be moderating this terrific conversation and she will be introducing our amazing and incredible speaker. So with that, I, I will stop sharing my screen here and hand this over to you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, and now I'm going to introduce, introduce our wonderful panelists. First up, we have Lind Lydia Chuk. After graduating from NYU Law in 1997, Lydia worked as corporate associate at Goodwin Proctor, then spent 15 years at Blue Man Group, including as general counsel and director of business affairs. She then served as head and senior vice president of business affairs at First Look Media before landing her current role as general counsel and corporate secretary at Away, a startup that specializes in designing travel essentials. Welcome, Lydia. And then our other wonderful panelist is Shayna Nidich. After graduating from NYU Law in 2002, Shayna was an associate at Simpson Thatcher and Bartlett before spending 10 years at Weight Watchers International as both senior corporate counsel and VP and assistant general counsel. For the past seven years, she's been a leader at ClassPass, Class the largest fitness health club and health club aggregator. She, Shayna is uh, first served as VP and head of legal and business affairs, and now as senior vice president and general counsel at ClassPass. Welcome to you as well, Shana. So I'm going to dive right in. Both of you are, le are le legal leaders in impressive startups and companies. Can you please share your thoughts on your career progression? We'd love to know about your time at NYU and what goals you had as a student. Goals that I have as a student. So, oh, I don't have a great answer for this because I'd like to say I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I, I studied 24 seven. I only was going to get all A's. Like I, I wish I could say something like that. And that is not what I was doing at all. So this is either going to be terrifying, liberating. I don't know. Um, but I really use that time to travel. Um, I took out a little more of student loans than I needed to, so I could travel. Um, I was thinking this is gonna be the last time I'm gonna have time off before I start working. And then I was like, and then I'm gonna to have to work forever. Um, so I kind of use this, I mean, I use this three years. I had, a, I had an awesome time. Like I had an awesome time. I went out a lot. I traveled a lot. I had a ton of fun. Um, and then I studied for finals. Like the, that was kind of it. Shana. I'm laughing because I'm having the nightmare, the recurring law school nightmares that I sometimes have are like being lived out in what you just said of waking up one day and having to go to a final and like I didn't go to class any day, any time. <laughs> um, 
a lot of, I mean, some of what you say really resonates. I, I went to law school straight out of college. Um, and at least when I was in undergrad, there was not a lot of attention put on sort of pre-professional. I, I was a liberal arts major and loved sort of reading and writing. And I knew I liked that. And I knew I was good at being a student and I had parents that were lawyers. So I just sort of showed up at NYU and I didn't have a particular goal other than I wanted to sort of absorb as much as I possibly could. So I wanted to take sort of a broad breadth of classes. I wanted to, you know, expose myself to different professors. Um, very excited to meet my uh, fellow students. I also I definitely wanted to challenge myself. I think I was still like quite young in, in many ways when I got to law school. And so even things like the Socratic method scared the crap out of me. And I was like forcing myself to participate in that. And it still probably would, but just sort of to have those experiences. And then of course, along the way to figure out um, what it is that I wanted to do, although I'm not sure how well I did that. But like you, Lydia, I, I love law school. I think, about, I think back to sort of making the decision about going to NYU and I'm one of the like life decisions that I'm still the most grateful for is having made that decision. That's great. I feel like I should have had more fun in law school. You're making me feel like <laughs> you I'm still not have doing time. <laughs> I think do it. it. I think first year is the hardest. So you're like actually coming out of that. So <laughs> um, so how did you use your legal education to land the GC role within tech? So how did that transition career-wise happen for both of you? Um, so for me, so so I went to the firm after law school. Um, and then there was a moment when I was at the firm where I literally said to myself, self, you have six months to get out of here. So you need to figure this out. And um, I just started talking to everyone I knew, particularly non-lawyers, um, because I think just growing up, like, I think I knew there were like lawyers and there are people who are doctors and maybe there are people who are like architects, but there's like that's like 1% of the jobs, right? There's like a million other jobs that no one ever tells you about when you're little. Um, so I just started talking to everyone I knew because I was thinking maybe I leave the law, maybe I do something different. Um, so I just started looking like crazy. And I still remember doing a job interview in one of those phone booths in the war room of Latham in DC working on a deal. And I remember doing an, a, just an interview for a job because I was like, I gotta get out of here. like. It just wasn't like, you know, I just knew in my heart, like that was not going to be my life's work, right? Being at the firm. Um, and so the job at Blue Man Group came up, which literally no lawyer had ever heard of um, because they had never hired a lawyer and no one knew. And they're an entertainment organization. And it was, it felt very like off the grid, like going to work there. Um, but I was also a theater kid. So I, I was like, oh, what is this thing? Um, and then I decided to go work for them. Um, and I have to tell you that I took an enormous six-figure pay cut to go work there. And I told myself, give it a year and then you'll just free agent yourself, right? So after a year, if they like me, I like them, I'm gonna renegotiate my salary and I'm gonna like make this way better. And, um, and I did. So I went to them after a year and I said, hey, I encourage you to go do your research to find out what someone in my position should make and come back to me and we'll talk about that. And it all worked out. Um, I can tell you a lot of the people that I talked to, like my law school friends, et cetera, when I told them I was going to take this job, thought I was crazy um, for sure. But I was like, Ah, why not? But I'm, I'm a little more of like a why not person. So um, I did it and it was, I mean, I was at that job for forever because I grew up there. It was incredible. It was an incredibly special experience that can never be replicated because it's an arts organization. And I worked with, I was the first lawyer. I worked, you know, my bosses were literally artists. So that's a very, very particular situation. And it also helped that we started like printing money, right? So the assistants had assistants, like it was, and so it was so much fun. It was incredible. I learned so much. I grew up there. So, um, I mean, I would say the last, I mean, like you can take a chance because the truth is, is 
everyone who's listening to this is very smart, very capable, has a lot of resources. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. You just have to decide that you want to do it. And I truly believe that. Did I answer the question? I think I went off on like this whole other thing just now. Yeah, no, it was about your pivot. So that was totally a full answer to the question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Shana. I'm um, thinking so, okay. I, and there's all, again, it's, it's interesting with a lot of what you say, we have similar, um, similar paths in some ways. So I was at Simpson for, I don't know, three ish years. And in some ways I, I can't, I sort of can't put it in the bucket of why did I make that decision? Because I definitely learned a tremendous amount. I met a lot of incredible people. It was truly sort of the definition of trial by fire, as cliche as that sounds, like I, I literally had no idea what I was doing and nobody's there to tell you and you just figure it out. And those are skills that I have taken with me, certainly to being a GC at a, you know, at, at a company where there's no other lawyers. Um, I very much had the stereotypical experience though. I worked all the time, nonstop on crazy m a deals i have emails that i sent my parents that they still show me at like four o'clock in the morning after not sleeping for a month where i was like what am i doing and but more than that right because i know you you can navigate that i think more than that i had the realization that one i was doing a tremendous amount of finance work and i knew that i didn't finance wasn't where i wanted my career to go and two Personality-wise, just from like wasn't going to be where I was going to most succeed. I really wanted to roll up my sleeves and be in a company and be part of a team and and not just be giving advice to somebody else, but actually sort of having to live and breathe the advice that I was giving. Um, so I looked for I looked for a role, and I guess my first piece of advice would be persistence and confidence because. I remember, so I was, a, I was a member of Weight Watchers at the time. And so Weight Watchers was like on my list of companies where I thought, oh, this would be amazing to go work for. I'm sure they don't need a lawyer. And they did, they actually had a job posting um, for a lawyer and it was listing out qualities that I didn't think I had and experience that I didn't think I had. And you needed to have an intellectual property background and licensing and other experiences that, yeah, I had sort of touched upon but didn't feel like I could speak to. And I passed it over. And believe it or not, literally like eight months later, I got a call from a headhunter who had this job opportunity at Weight Watchers that they still hadn't hired for. And it was such a moment of like, okay, wow. Like I had this view of myself as not being sort of qualified enough when really what they wanted at the end of the day was somebody who was sort of smart and capable and could learn on the job. And, and I think this is where NYU actually really did help because having that and that's of course the firm on my resume like gave them confidence that okay maybe I didn't know licensing particularly well but I had the ability and the tools to sort of figure it out as I went so that was actually like a startup within everyone thinks of Weight Watchers as sort of this big old school company but actually at the time it was a startup within the within the um larger org which in many ways, it was like a unique way of getting into tech, I think, and sort of lucky. It wasn't intentional. I just wanted sort of, I just wanted in-house. And I ended up at in-house startup within something that had sort of the framework of a much larger company. So like, even though Lydia, to your point, I had to take a, a fairly large pay cut going from firm to in-house, it had an infrastructure that was much more established than a, than a typical startup. And so I think I got a little bit lucky in retrospect that I didn't have to sort of see some of the decisions that going straight into a startup you might have had to make and is actually an interesting way perhaps of looking at getting into sort of startup and tech world of like approaching you might think you want startup but there are larger organizations and other companies that have unique ways to sort of get the startup culture within something larger um and so, yeah, I think that's basically NYU, I, I, I'll pause there, lots of pivots to go forward, but I think like the NYU uh, absolutely was an important part. And taking the right classes, honestly, if you think you wanna get into tech and startup world, I do think being able to sort of speak to some IP um, related, um, having some familiarity with e-commerce, et cetera, I'm sure there are a lot more classes now than <laughs> in the olden days when we went to law school. And that stuff is not make or break, but it helps. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you kind of touched on this about the um, pay cut sort of going from firms to startup world. And how did you fund that? Did, it, did you have to change your lifestyle? Like how did the transition happen for you financially? Um, 
Okay, I'll go first. Um, well, I mean, obviously at the firm, I mean, and this is almost always going to be true. There are exceptions to this, but the and especially now, I mean, the firms are just paying, it's insanity, like what's been going on with the firms, how much they pay. So if you want to move in-house, you're probably going to have to take a pay cut. And of course, everyone has the dream of like the big exit of which a small percentage of people will experience that. Um, but at the time, how did I finance that? I mean, I got real frugal. Um, but I also, I mean, like for me, like I was never really spendy when I worked at the firm because I worked all the time. So it's not like I was, you know, rolling deep at the club. <laughs> I was, I was, right. I, I mean, I was just working all the time. And so, um, but I did really have to, you know, but I, but like I mentioned earlier, like, I was like, look, I'm going to do this for a year and we'll see how that goes. Um, cause I wasn't going to be able to sustain, um, like that small of a salary for that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are sacrifices, but I, I mean, 100%, like it was a hundred percent worth it. It's funny. I'm thinking like, I, I feel really lucky in a lot of ways that I, not to say, again, I definitely took a pay cut, but it was because I was at a, a normal, sort of a normal company, the sort of more intentional financial decision I had to make really was when I went from a big company and then 10 years later to like this startup that was series B craziness and really sort of learning about the how to understand the difference between a salary a bonus and equity like those are things that I think when you're at a firm you just sort of are in lockstep and you take for granted and you don't appreciate that there are the differences and actually doing a little bit of talking to people in the industry and understanding like, okay, are there trade-offs that I should make? If, if what I need now is cash and, you know, is that, if that's important to me, am I willing to sort of take a hit and take less stock options and less equity? And is that a negotiating tip that I can use sort of in my discussions or, or, on, or, con or on the contrary, like I have a lot of faith in this startup. I think that it's going to be huge. I'm in early like, I'm going to look at this as a long game and Lydia's point, sort of really be careful about my spending now with the hope, not the expectation, but the hope that this sort of plays out. I think that for me was like the first thing, thinking about going into sort of early stage startup was really the first time I had to think like that. And that's like maybe even thinking about being intentional about thinking about sort of the stage startup that you go to, because obviously the earlier stage for, for I think for me and Lydia, we found that a lot of fun and exciting and you know, figuring stuff out as you go. But of course, the sort of later the stage, the more established, the more actual um, salary they can give, the more you can have the conversation, like look at what other companies in the market are, get, are, are paying and they have to sort of take that seriously. And they've, been, they've, they've likely been spending a lot of money on outside counsel at that point. So they understand better than a much earlier stage company sort of how much lawyers actually cost and how much they can benefit by just paying you one salary as opposed to bleeding cash to a firm. Makes sense. Um, shifting a little bit to our, our theme of the night is leadership. And so I wanted to ask, how do you position yourself to be lead, leaders? You know, your general counsels, you're in charge of a, a legal team, a legal eco ecosystem in, within a country. How did you get there and position yourself to be there? Um, I think, um, well, I think it's, I mean, being hired in as GC, so presuming that I'm in this role, um, and not all GC positions are created equal. There are, I think something that people often don't think about, even people who are lawyers and been practicing for some time, um, I think some companies really value legal and some companies really make GCs as part of that real exact leadership team and they're considered truly one of the leaders in the company. I think there are some companies that don't value legal in that way and they're a little bit more back office-y. Um, and I think if you're looking for legal jobs in-house, sometimes it's a little bit hard to discern where that job sits, meaning like where legal, how legal is valued within that company. Um, so ideally you're at a company where legal is really valued. And then, so if you are lucky to be in that position, um, I think like for instance, at a way, I think 
me and my team, um, we're lucky in that our founder really values legal. And because of that, legal just has always had a seat at the table, but you kind of have to earn it, right? So how, like, how do you build those relationships? Like you have to build your relationships always. That's very, very important. Um, how do you be a thought partner um, to your fellow execs? Um, how do you basically coach your team that works beneath you to be, you know, kind of like ambassadors for the legal team? And so how do you maintain that value um, in the company? And for me and my team, I think the reason that my team, my, my team has been, been with me for a while now for a startup, they've been with me, our team's very, very stable. Um, and I think it's because they are offered that opportunity to be thought partners to the company. And that means you're really involved in how the business is run. People come to you for non-legal advice all the time. Um, and a lot of that is just because you know the business, mm -hmm. like you've seen it. Um, and um, you know, you kind of just, you need to know yourself, right? So really come prepared and really come prepared with solutions. I'm shaking my head vigorously. If you could see <laughs> in agreement. Uh, um, I, a couple of thoughts just to mostly echo what Lydia said, I think in-house and particularly at startup, you sort of need to be able to demonstrate that you're a commercial business part person first and a lawyer second, even though you know you're a lawyer first. <laughs> um, and I think that means, as Lydia said, knowing your product and your business inside and out. It means establishing relationships with people. It means being vocal in meetings, not just about legal issues, but also about business issues. So people sort of come to see you as a true um, champion for the business and not just, I think lawyers have a reputation for being sort of conservative in the no team and they just know their own lane. So some of it is sort of just being a business partner, as Olivia said, like empowering your team to constantly set up meetings with other members of the organization. But then there's sort of the in parallel, very intentional, like how do you get your executive team to really see you as um, somebody they turn to and trust. Like they, the anecdote I often share uh, sort of very frankly is like the relationship that I have with our CEO now is something that really had to be developed over time, but something that I'm like the most proud of and most grateful for. When I, when I started at ClassPass, it was like, literally there were no adults in the room. I was like literally called the grandma. <laughs> like it was just like a free for all. And that meant there was no, like our, C, our CEO at the time was our founder who was amazing and wonderful, but she wasn't necessarily focused on sort of the day-to-day -day operations. And then our, our current CEO came in and he had a lot of work to do to write the ship and caring about and thinking about legal issues was like not at all top of his mind. I mean, literally I would get a lot of this when I would see him in the hallway, like you just do your thing. I don't want to know. Not, not there was nothing personal about it. It's more just like, I don't want to be sucked down with anything that's going to hold us back from moving as fast as we can. He's actually calling me right now. <laughs> I'm going to hang this up. <laughs> and so, um, over time sort of showing in this case our CEO that you know not only can you be relied upon to sort of be a commercial thought partner but you actually have things to say from a legal perspective that are going to only help the company right so I'm going to give you advice I'm going to give you things to think about that aren't saying no but they are watch out and together we can figure out how to get stuff done that you want to get done that might actually be risky or I'm going to tell you there are risks to things but I'm not telling you, you can't do it. I'm just telling you, think about the consequences. And if you're okay with it, let's hold hands and, and jump. And sort of that kind of stuff, I think sometimes comes just with time and effort and like actual sort of demonstrating in action um, and not being afraid to have tough conversations and give advice when somebody doesn't necessarily want to, to hear it. Um, and then I guess maybe whether like being authentic, I think one thing you and I definitely have in common is just sort of being very real approachable people that the rest of the org sort of knows that they can come to with any problem. And that actually, I think gives them a lot of comfort and helps you sort of organically be seen as a leader. Yeah, um, you, talked sort of, 
Uh, no, this is all great stuff. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, your relationship to like the executive team. I was curious about your relationship to your team in particular. What is your leadership style? How do you ensure that your um, authority is listened to, but also letting people grow? How does that work for you? Um, so for me, I think this is like, what is my leadership style? I'd love, like, um, I feel like, do I have a style per se? Um, I think um, they would say that I'm tough because I am tough. Um, I think I like to think of myself as tough, but fair. Um, I am tough. Um, I expect excellence, um, but I know they can, they offer excellent. I hired all of them. So, and they're amazing and I love them. Um, I think they know that the expectation is very high, that it's excellence, that this is our team. This is our team's brand. Like we always deliver excellence. Um, I think it's also, I mean, I always like to, I mean, like Shana just said, I mean, I'm kind of just who I am. So um, for better or for worse, um, I think I do try to remember to address the humanity of it all. Um, like we're not, you know, we're all human beings. We all have lives outside of work. Um, I think they all are very confident that I have their back. So like we are truly like a team, right? Like, and, and I feel really lucky that we have that um, support um, and we all know, I mean, we have articulated this to, I mean, actually out loud to each other. So like, you know, I think we have a really awesome team and I feel super, super lucky for that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, you gotta do the work, but also like, I'm their friend. I'm not their best friend, but I'm their friend and they know that I'm here to support them if they need that. Trying, that, that, that was really, really well said. I think the most vigorous head shaking that I did was when you said, um, they know I've got their back. I think, gosh, especially like your lead, especially at a startup, your legal team is probably going to be small. It's going to be really awesome group of individuals. I find that I found that we are in general sort of on balance more senior as a whole than the rest of the org. So um, what that means is I think each individual on the team can be can and should be empowered to be responsible for their areas and get a lot of stuff done sort of independently. And so finding the right balance between like not micromanaging, not being in the weeds with people, but also being there if they need some sounding board or you as a thought partner, I think is really important. And then standing behind, helping them stand behind the decisions that they've made. So one of the things we try really hard to avoid, because this is inevitable, is sort of the like cherry picking of advice. So somebody gets a piece of advice from one of the members of the team and they don't like the information they get and they go to somebody else and say, oh, I have a question. And like, they try to sort of find the answer that way. And you know, one example of how like that's just not acceptable and we all have each other's backs. And certainly if, if somebody gives advice that maybe they want to rethink or they want to talk through, like that's, that's fine, but there's no, um, there's no second guessing each other sort of in front of each other. Um, there's also like letting people shine, you know, making sure that you, they get exposure to the executive team and in their particular area, they feel like they're really the, the true owners. Um, I like what you said too, Lydia, about sort of, you have high expectations. I think that's really important. Like it sort of should go without saying that people are going to be really hard workers. It doesn't mean, sorry, this is important. It doesn't mean that they know, you have to know everything. One of the things I've hired a bunch of generalists basically. And, and in this world, I feel like generalists don't necessarily exist in the same way as it maybe did 20 years ago. I think lawyers are more and more growing up as Special specialists and picking an area of the law and really like knowing it well. Most of the people that I, myself certainly, and the most people on the team have a very broad remit. And it means we're just not going to know the answer to, to everything. I, I sort of, I think I said this to Lydia early on in our relationship, and you were like, don't ever say that again. It's horrible and boring. But I said that like our jobs in some ways are like a torts exam where you, you, I know. <laughs> She said towards the exam to me and like, I, I, I was like, triggered or something. I was like, yeah, let's not, but it is. Let's not call you it. Spot the issue. 
and articulate it and know that there's a problem, but you don't necessarily have to know like, like, oh, there, there might be an antitrust issue here, but you don't have to be the expert. And so making sure that you have your eyes open and are flagging, that the team understands that their job is to flag everything, even if it's not something that's within their strength, but I don't expect you to know the answer. I do expect you to raise your hand and sort of ask for help when you need it. Um, yeah, and then to your point, Fred, like we all, there's a there's a, an organic respect and camaraderie. One thing I also will say, like COVID has obviously been very challenging times for everybody. And I have, was not somebody historically that leaned into shocking, like that leaned into sort of the socializing. We didn't have a lot of team happy hours and team events. And maybe that's because we're such a small team. I felt like, well, we have these weekly meetings, we're meeting, you know, we don't need to socialize with each other in that way. And I found that during COVID people were craving sort of the, um, the touch point and we did a lot of more socializing. And I think even that had sort of awesome unanticipated consequences of just sort of even bringing us closer together and the respect level that much higher when you're all seeing all of the crazy life that everyone's juggling behind the scenes and everyone's like a real person. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I go on, I want to invite our audience members to please, if you have any questions for our lovely panelists, to drop them in the Q&A. I will read them, so no fear of having to public speak. Uh, we really want to make sure this is an engaging conversation for everyone. So please just drop any questions you have in. So while we wait for questions, um, what is a tough lesson you learned on the job? Shana, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I will actually, if you, if that's, I'm happy to, because I, it's funny. I sort of in the middle of experiencing one, so I'll share. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I, I want to speak. I haven't, I haven't said this one out loud. So I want to be thoughtful about it, but you know, I know that one of the themes of the session tonight is on leadership and sort of the full transparency is like my, my leadership style is probably a little bit softer and a little bit um, less in your face than a stereotypical like leader type A. I, I think I have a lot of type A qualities, but I'm not necessarily like in a in the group of executives going to be sort of the bang on the table. You need to listen to me, kind of leader. That means you know that means sort of being thoughtful and listening and participating when I think it's appropriate, not just speaking for the sake of being heard. It means um, lots of things that come along with that. And I sort of took for granted that people recognize that that is its own type of leadership and that has its own strengths. And that like one of the beauties of across the, sort of a, a group of leaders is you have different types of leaders and the balance and that is what makes it, um, what makes a group really strong. And um, without going into too much detail, I'll say I was in a meeting where we're talking about um, promotion cycles and sort of, okay, now there's a group of individuals that we need to promote from X level to Y level, sort of a much more senior, senior level. And one of the, and one of the criticisms of a particular individual, and it was a woman, was that she was not the traditional leader. She was a little bit quieter. She sort of held back. She, and it was, the discussion was around like, is that, it, it, does she have the gravitas? Does she have the qualities of somebody to be a VP at the company? And for me, that was like a mind blowing moment. And I very, at that moment, I got very vocal. <laughs> um, but it, it was a reminder for myself as a leader, but also as I'm an advocate for other individuals in the organization, it was a reminder that you can't take for granted that, under, that people understand sort of that all different sizes and shapes and styles of individuals can be leaders. And there is a stereotype and we have to continue, I think, to vo verbally, vocally sort of um, work against it because you otherwise turn around and you've got many ways, you've got all individuals that are very similar to each other in a room making decisions. And that's just no good for, for anybody. So it was a good reminder and something that I really wanna spend some time thinking about and making sure that, you know, if I, if I see particularly high performers in the org, want to make sure they understand like the, I want to make sure they have the visibility they need, even if they aren't sort of what you think of as a traditional leader. Um, I love that. I love that, Jaina. 
Yeah. Um, I've been racking my brain. Um, what is my answer to, to this? Like, what, what am I? So I'm always learning things all the time. And I think about as far as like, how do I, how do I manage my team? And a lot of it is, is based on like, oh, well, how do I want to be managed? Right. And I think about that a lot. Um, and relatedly to that, I think, and I've been reminded this by our head of people um, many times that I need to model the behavior that I expect of my team. And um, because I thought, so for instance, PTO. So I actually am, uh, I really encourage my team to take their PTO and we're a very hardworking team. And um, often we don't take our, like all our PTO and often we work on PTO and in a way, I think we're all, I mean, you know, we all came out of the firm. We all blah, blah, blah. Right. So like, I think we all have this training that it's like being a lawyer is being on call all the time. And that sounds ridiculous when, because we're not actually like cardiac surgeons. Um, and I think even cardiac surgeons go on vacation, but, um, so something I've been doing in the last couple of years is I'm like, I'm very vocal about urging my team, like take your PTO, take your PTO. I even like put a thing in my calendar on a quarterly basis, like to see who's taken their PTO, like over the year, because I want to remind them don't just either a, don't save it to the end of the year, but be like, just take it. Right. Like we all need to take our PTO and like our company's very generous with PTO. So we should just use it. Um, and so I was telling my team, everyone, hey, take your PTO, who's taking your PTO, you know what? And then um, somebody on my team said, oh, for, coming from the person who never takes PTO. And that was like a dagger in the heart because I, it, like, it was like a moment where I was like, oh, like obviously they're not going to feel free to take their PTO if they think the expectation is that we're all working all the time because that's what they see me doing. And so I should just take more PTO, um, which sounds like a lovely thing to do, but that feels hard. Like that, and Gina, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like it feels hard to do, um, especially because it's like, I can't tell my CEO like, oh, I'm on vacation. So, you know, I, I mean, if she needs me to do something, I have to do it. So, um, but I think that there are a lot of guardrails that I could be setting up. So I think for me, it's the, right now it's the modeling behavior. There are things, really yeah. Yeah, especially in this world of burnout and attrition, and you don't want people to feel like the expectation of them is something that's unrealistic. It's a really good because point. I thought I was doing it by being very vocal about telling them to take the PTO. But if I'm not doing it, then it like see yep. right. There's like this yep. subliminal yep. thing that's like not. Yep. It's not healthy. Yep. One other, I, at the risk of belaboring this question, I, I had one other thought also that I, I thought maybe it's worth sharing because it feels like. It actually feels like a nugget that, that is something I wish I had known earlier, um, unrela unrelated to modeling, Lydia, but I, I'm, I'm curious what your experience with this has been. I think one other tough lesson I've learned is like, you want to assume the best in your colleagues and, and every, that like everyone's got each other's back. But the truth is, is like, even at a small startup, there is politics, there is people have their own agendas. And I think I would say, like as a lawyer, one of the things you advise the organization all the time is to be careful what you put in writing. And, you know, would you want what you're saying in email to be printed on the front page of the New York Times? If not, don't say it, that kind of thing. On the other hand, there are moments when the right thing, to, I hate to use the concept of C, the word CYA or cover your ass, but like there are moments when CYA is important and you if you're giving it tough advice and you feel like you're not being heard and feel like it's not being considered correctly, or there's going to be a decision, maybe they have heard you, but there's going to be a decision that I have consequences. One piece of advice I can have is I've learned that like, if you don't actually have a paper trail of what you've said and done later on, there can be a revisionist history that just becomes more challenging. And not that you're ever going to want to pull up an email and say, see, I gave you this advice, but sometimes to protect yourself in that way and to sort of make sure that the business has an opportunity to really see what you're trying to tell them as opposed to just, yeah, yeah, yeah I got you is, is an important tool. Um, and so I, well, would just I also that. find just writing that email gives people pause because they know what you're doing, <laughs> right? So they're like, why is she 
doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I hear you. That's like a, a, a rare needed thing. It's rare. I agree with you, but it's the kind of thing that when you learn the lesson, you're like, Ooh, I wish I could already done that. <laughs> Good advice. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the Q and a, um, so there's an NYU alum who's currently working at big law and looking to transition. Um, and so she wanted to ask a couple of questions. The first being, can you share some advice about picking the right in-house job or the right startup to join? Um, also, what are some ways to meet in-house lawyers to learn more about their jobs? And apart from licensing, what are experiences or skills that can help um, her become a more desirable candidate? So all the advice you have around transition. Shani, you wanna go? I'm sorry, something just happened to my computer. Um, I, I think I think I might need the question from <laughs> okay, okay, I can go. Advice for transitioning, <laughs> advice or transitioning between big law to in-house. Okay. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, let's see. What I would say to that is, well, first of all, the market is so hot right now. So if you are beyond, like if you're, I mean, some people will hire like a one out or, or like a first year, but like if you're a third year, those there's, I mean, the, the world is your oyster. If you're looking right now, I think a lot of people, uh, there's so many in-house jobs, especially for junior people. Um, I will tell you that I had never hired someone straight out of a firm until last year um, because I wanted somebody with the in-house role because the in-house job is a completely different job. It, it's just a completely different job. It's not oh, I'm a lawyer at a firm and now I'm a lawyer here. It's just a completely different job. Um, and it requires kind of learning a new language, like learning how to speak to people who are not, because most of the people you work with are non-lawyers, right? Because you're not gonna be working with your team of lawyers because you're all working on different things. Um, so it's about communication style, um, learning the business, all of that. Um, but how to meet other in-house lawyers. I mean, there's so many, I mean, there must be, I mean, there's gotta be so many networking groups. I mean, I'm only an in-house networking group, so I'm having a hard time naming what those would be for people at firms. Um, but also I know that, and I know this because I have friends who work at firms who talk to me about jobs, but I mean, the firms represent a lot of early stage, mid stage, late stage startups. So I know they're not gonna wanna say to you, of course, oh, why don't you go work at the client? But there's something there, right? Because mm -hmm. you, if you, if your firm has a lot of startup clients, you will have access. And I'm not saying, you know, you're gonna go over there and say, oh, will you hire me? But those are relationships that you can cultivate. Like if you have clients that are startups, those are some really good relationships that you can cultivate. And those are really good resources. That's a really good suggestion. I, I, this is, it's tricky on how, like what advice to give somebody who's in big law and how, what can make you stand out to have, to get that in-house job? Because to your point, Lydia, I feel like if the, the challenge is the combination of sort of your, if you're more junior, you don't have a ton of experience. And so you've got the in-house person saying, oh God, like, I don't want to have to train this person. I don't have enough time to do that. And to your point, you've got a, like a different personality style often in-house. There's just a different way that lawyers interact with each other that big house, we all big, big law as we can, we demonstrated, you can absolutely get there, but it takes a little bit of time. On the flip side, we both went straight from, as young lawyers, we both went straight from a firm to in-house. So I feel like there's gotta be lessons in that. Um, and in some ways, Lydia, I'm almost looking at like, what is it that we have in common that maybe, or, or, or what was in common about our experiences that we can maybe sort of leverage for people. And I think some of it was sort of this, oh, gosh, I think the, the somehow you need to be able to demonstrate in an interview like that you are a 
fast learner that you are able to sort of um, see the forest from the trees that you don't need to be handheld that you're able to sort of figure stuff out like even if you're nervous about that you have to sort of walk in with the with the mindset of I got this and um and I think you need to be really real and authentic and relatable and don't come across to the extent you can as like a law firm I've got my head down I'm a lawyer I'm a lawyer I think in-house there's a little bit more of you're a human and you're a business person and you're a lawyer and we talk a lot about like nobody thinks of themselves as a lawyerly lawyer, but the firm kind of beats that into you. So you have that just sort of innately <laughs> as part of who you are and trying to sort of relate to people a little bit more as a business person instead of just a lawyer, thinking about proactively the kinds of risks that you think the company might be facing and talking to them about it, sort of just sort of showing them that you can think as a person about what um, might be impacting them and their lives and not just sort of, oh, I know how to do M&A and this is what I'm gonna do for you. Um, I mean, classes are a harder one also. Again, I, I feel like I took a really just broad base of transactional, I, I knew I didn't wanna do litigation. So at most, of the, most of the courses and workshops that I took were very transactional based. There were very few things that I actually leveraged once I had a job that was from law school. So some of other than, than IP and whatever, you know, if there are courses now on what's it like to be in-house in startup world and anything you can get your hands on that you think has practical application, I think that only helps you and I would do it and would make, and it's gonna make, give you resources to make your life easier. Um, I, mean, I can like tell you like, so the last lawyer that I hired came from a firm and, um, and I knew that I would have almost definitely have to hire someone from a firm because I wanted someone very junior, right? So just literally, there's just not enough years to be at a firm and have in-house and still be like a fourth year, right? So I knew they would come from a firm, but I was prepared to do that because I'd already, I already have like two very strong lawyers who the truth is they would be the one charged to, to train that person. Um, and so when I look at the resumes, you know, when I look at 80 resumes of people who all went to good schools and, you know, went to, you know, name the 15 firms that we could all name, or you guys could all name, I can't name any of them anymore, but these same firms, right? So what stands out about them? Um, and I don't know if this is helpful because I don't know how much you, one can change, right? But um, I like that they had work experience before they went to law school, because I thought they would be just more um, just be more experienced in the workplace um, and know how to communicate with people that are not lawyers because they were working before they were lawyers. Um, and the truth is, it's really hard to like to discern between all of these different candidates if the resumes are all very similar other than prior work experience. And the truth is, I just really liked her, right? Because it has to be somebody I'm going to talk to five times a week a lot. My team has to really like them and my entire company has to really like them because again, she's an ambassador for my team, which I have spent three years building. So, um, and also the truth is for me, like diversity hire was very, very important, like really, really important. So that did narrow the pool as well. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone I talked to was really smart. Everyone, everyone I talked to went to big law, everyone, right? So there were just kind of these other little things that um, are maybe a little bit less tangible, but I think showing that you have a real interest in the business and that you know the business and you can just Google that, right? Because you definitely get the feeling when you're interviewing with some people that they're just interviewing for like 500 different jobs. And yeah, I, I think that's really real. Yeah, I don't want that person, right? Yeah. Like when I chose to go to Away, it was because I loved the brand. Like I, are, I mean, if you don't know, we sell suitcases, et cetera, et cetera. I already owned an away suitcase in 2017. That was very early days. So I already, I already loved the brand before I started at away. Um, and I just really wanted to work for away. And I think I want someone who really wants to work for away. Yeah. Right. Yep. That's really, I mean, I had a very similar, I was a an early class pass member and I was like, I love this company and I'm not leaving my job that I love unless it's something right and that it like it worked out but that's an interesting point right that 
you're not, not everyone's going to find a job at a company that they have a close affinity with, but you absolutely can learn about the company that you're interviewing with. And it's a, it's a very, it's a very natural way to make yourself stand out in, in an, an important way. You touched on this earlier too, and this also is a little bit harder because you may not have as much control over it, but I'm just thinking now about when I have interviewed candidates from firms, those who have been able to speak to some experience at the firm that did, you know, wasn't just doing diligence on an, uh, for a merger and instead was, oh, I had to review this outsourcing agreement and it just, and, you know, them being able to demonstrate that you actually tried to take the initiative at the firm to do some of the work that you find interesting and that you might see in-house also was sort of like, oh, this person has a sense of, they don't just want to get out of big law. They actually have a sense of what they want to do and they tried to seek it out. And I'm not going to hold it against them if they don't have a ton of experience in it. Instead, I'm going to be impressed that they tried to navigate what can be sort of an overwhelming place where you don't really necessarily get your choice. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Sally. Um, we have time for one more. Um, seeing none in the chat, I'm gonna pick up a, on a thread that Lydia kind of talked about, um, which is diversity in tech, which has been sort of a really important issue um, in terms of you know politically, and, and I think socially, a lot of people are thinking about that. And uh, we, we're wondering, can you tell us what's working well and what your companies are doing to make positive change in that? in that aspect. You want to go ahead? Or... Yeah, you can go ahead. Oh. You know, this is an interesting moment for, for me to answer this question because um, ClassPass actually just got acquired um, a bunch of months ago. And so now we are now going through a process of you know, being this scrappy small startup now being a part of a much larger organization that has a lot of process and a lot of different ways they do things. So I'm still in many ways still trying to learn sort of you know, all of the puts and takes, but I would say like, there are not a lot of women in leadership at this, at this company. There's not like, there's a lot of, it's not a lot of diversity and they know it and it's something that they clearly need to change. And I'm, in, I am hopeful and impressed that it's, that they are taking the steps they need to take. But it's hard, I would say. I think what I'm seeing so far and what I certainly saw at ClassPass was a bunch of things. I think it's not just a one size fits all. So there's um, transparency, basically like an acknowledgement of this is an issue, this is a problem and we see it and we want to address it. Instead of, I think there was a feeling of historical, you know, like, oh, this is not something that we as an organization or as employees can talk about. Um, Lots, I mean, lots of initiatives. So there's um, we training and bringing people in to actually talk to people, not just not just about diversity specifically, but just sort of a general inclusive mindset. Lots of encouraging collaboration across the organization, so that different people get to work together. Mentorship programs when we can have them. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing that I really am hopeful will actually make a difference is. Um, company objectives, like key object, like QBRs, OKRs that are based on actually moving the needle in measurable ways. So it's not just like, oh, we need to have a more diverse organization. It's like, no, here's where we are today. By the end of the year, you know, we're gonna have X percent diversity in leadership or X number of women or ho however, whatever the, whatever the stat is, but like, we're gonna be vocal about it. We're gonna take action against it and we're gonna hold ourselves responsible if we don't meet it. Feel it, it's one of the few things I've seen where I, you can tell the organization feels like, okay, this company takes this seriously. This isn't just like, I've got a half hour of something thrown on my calendar. The other thing that, I was, that I've seen that I am hopeful really goes, makes an impact is this is not, this is, this is not for the whole org. So take that for what you will, at least so far, I hope it will eventually, but it's bringing in a coach who actually has one-on-one -on -one experiences with our senior execs. And really like, it's a lot of sort of self-reflection. There's a lot of anonymous feedback that is given around the individual about sort of how inclusive are they? What are they, what behaviors do they have? You know, what experiences have you had as a as a woman that have made you feel a certain way and you're encouraged to be, and I, I certainly have been as transparent as I can be. 
And I think like one of the only ways to really make change is to have executives at the top really um, be as sort of transparent and as aware of what's going on within themselves as well. So I'm hopeful that that will, um, that will be a catalyst for sort of making all of these other initiatives keep going and have momentum behind them as opposed to sort of just being driven by the employee base. Um, Lydia, I'm curious what you guys have been up to. Um, so this stuff is, is really hard. I mean, it's interesting hearing you talk, Shannon, because for us, like we don't have a woman problem. We have, you know, we have, we're, I mean, it's female founders, um, five out of eight of our execs are women. Like, you know, we're an organization that is 60% women in general. So like the leadership is more than 60%. The company wide is, is um, 60%. Um, I mean, we do talk about like the, you know, the number of POCs at our company. I mean, I think for us, that's kind of, you know, where we're challenged, um, like so much of the world is, I think, um, you know, it's something that we talk about a lot. We talked about it yesterday in our exec meeting, right? And it's really about the pipeline, right? So what does our commitment to the pipeline for POCs to come into our, um, to come in our, to our organization? What does that look like and how do we build that? Because we are aware and we have articulated this that you know, people often hire people like, oh, well, I used to work with them and I know they're really great. And so I want to hire them. And everyone knows like, you know, people hire and so it's, it's a pipeline issue, right? So how do you, do, I mean, it's very challenging. Um, there are, you know, recruiters who special, especially now who specialize in that there are, um, different platforms that are meant for to recruit um, POCs. Um, so these are the things that we're talking about. And we know that that is something that we need to focus on. It's hard. Yeah, no, sorry to end on a tough question, but yeah. um, thank you for your insights. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for attending today. Lydia and Shayna, it has been such a pleasure to learn from your journey and listen to you give great advice. And we cannot wait to see what you're going to accomplish in the future. Um, this has been inspiring. And I think I personally really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone in the audience as well. Um, so I wanted to say enjoy the evening. And thanks to all who attended our event today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so thank much. You. This was great. Thank thanks, you. Good night. Bye. Thanks.